Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, this is the great problem for all theories of memory. We know that in, if you live to be 70 years old, that every molecule in your body will be exchanged approximately 10 times. Well, then how is it that a 70-year-old woman can remember what it was like to be taken in the arms of her grandmother and the smell of the perfume that the old lady wore. I mean, that is just an absolute mystery. And the hardcore, if you're a hardcore materialist, and God knows they're around somewhere, probably not here, but if you're a hardcore materialist, then you say, well, something must persist. And if we could figure out the one thing that persists, then we'd have it nailed. Well, it turns out there is something which persists. It, the, the, the neurons do not cycle over. You are born with a certain number of neurons, and you die with a few less, depending on your drug-taking history. And they are never replaced, and they are never cycled out. Well, we, but then the materialists break down because this magical substance, which you would think would help them solve their memory problems, the theories necessary to turn it into the story side of memory are too fantastic for them to swallow. You would have to go to something like the Invisible Landscape, plug, plug, to find a theory radical enough to account for that because you would have to hypothesize molecular storage almost at the speed of a tape recorder of theoretically an entire lifetime. So 70, let's make it 35 years because presumably you don't retain your dreams very useful. So let's say 30 years of continuous tape recording being downloaded into something under eight angstroms in diameter and with no degradation of, of the data stream and so forth and so on. I mean, it becomes insupportable and fantastic in their minds, but perhaps not. I mean, why is... I mean, nature has a peculiar way of, uh, of using redundancy like once nature finds a way to do something, she will tend to use that technique over and over again in different applications. We see that the problem of storage of information and retrieval of information and non-degradation of that information has all been solved in the functioning of DNA. Uh, but the information that is stored in DNA, if you talk to an information theorist, they will say, well, it's not like memory. It's not like people's faces or their addresses and telephone numbers. It's just protein synthesis. It's structures for protein synthesis. And you mustn't be so naive as to confuse this with real information and pat on the head, so forth and so on. But... Here we have the DNA, the central molecular machinery of life, and for reasons known to nobody, vast sections of it are what are called silent DNA. What does that mean? It means those parts of the DNA don't code for proteins. Well, but maybe they code for something else. Maybe they code for memory. And maybe the so-called random or trash arrangement of nucleotides in those sections of the DNA are, in fact, our memory. I mean, memory is very mysterious, and the mechanism which explains it may involve principles at the edge of or beyond the grasp of current science. I mean, think of it. You know, I, I have memories going back to eight months and many people report memories under three years. And often these are in are movies, you know. The most highly degradable and data-dense form of image storage there is. I mean, that's why it's so maddening to store images, you know, videotape on computers today, because it's so uh, memory-intensive, as they say in the biz. 
And yet this seems to be how we store our 